Electrophilic Aromatic Substitution, EAS, it's one of the cornerstones of Orgo 2. It's also a big MCAT topic, which can have a lot to memorize for probably at most one question, given that there are only 16 or so Orgo questions on the entire test. So this video will be about some shortcuts you can take to reduce all of the information you need to know, but still talk about it in depth. So let's do it. We start with the mechanism, and I find it useful in committing mechanisms to memory to draw them yourself either along with me or pause the video after I've done it, rather than just watch. Remember, Orgo is like math, and I can talk all I like or all you like, but it's not going to make you learn it. Doing problems will. So, one of the double bonds gives its electrons to the electrophile. In this case, it's a chloronium ion, which I'm just representing as Cl plus here, even though that's not how they exist. Uh, that's not important. But what is important is this step creates a cation on the ring. The cation, through resonance, can do this ring around the rosy sort of mechanism. But remember, none of these states actually exist, this is just how we represent it. After it goes around the ring, a base then pulls off a proton from the same carbon the electrophile added to, reforming the benzene ring with the new substituent on it. So it's a two-step reaction, and as you can imagine, the slow rate-determining step is the first one. Opening up a stable benzene ring into something much less stable requires a fair amount of energy. So here are some classic EAS reactions. Go ahead and pause the video here if you want to review these. You should already be familiar with really all these reactions, but don't worry so much about committing them to memory. Questions concerning EAS and the MCAT will almost certainly involve some sort of synthesis or substituents of substituent effects, which I'll get to in just a bit. First though, Friedel-Crafts alkylation and acylation are two big ones you should know that aren't as straightforward as, say, bromination or nitration. The big tell for these reactions is the Lewis acid, aluminum trichloride. If you see that in the reaction, think Friedel-Crafts. So, as you can see, in alkylation, the R group gets added to the ring, which seems simple enough, but the mechanism mechanism of this involves carbocation formation. And whenever you hear that, a little rearrangement light bulb should be going off in your head. If the R group can rearrange to form a more stable carbocation, it will. Acylation is very similar, and can happen with acid anhydrides as well. The way I always remember these was to think of the alkyl or acyl group doing a 180 and connecting to the ring where the chlorine used to be. And something extra, in case you get one of those separating the men from the boys type questions on the MCAT, Friedel Crafts is so slow that it will not happen if there's a meta directing or moderately to strongly deactivating substituent on the ring. Which brings us to substituent effects. First, the positions. Starting with toluene here, these two positions, one carbon adjacent, are ortho, O. These two positions, two carbons away, are meta. M, and this one on the opposite side of the ring is para, P. Substituents can be both ortho and para directing, or meta directing, and typical MCAT questions will probably ask what the major product is. It can get a bit tricky with ortho and para since both are produced. The general rule of thumb is that for non-bulky starting substituents, like the methyl group on toluene, there will be more ortho products since there are two spots for the substitute to go versus just one for the para position. But the bulkier the original substituent, the more favor the para position is, as there's just too much stuff in the way to favor ortho. A T-butyl group, for instance, instead of a methyl group, uh, would produce a para major product instead of an ortho. So what makes a substituent ortho para or meta directing? It has to do with if it activates or deactivates the ring. If it activates the ring, it's orthopara. If it deactivates the ring, it's meta. The only exceptions to this rule are the halogens, which are weakly deactivating yet actually direct orthopara. To be honest, the reasons behind activation and deactivation are probably not at all important for answering MCAT questions. The shortcuts are really all you need, so I'll just discuss them briefly. Activators donate electron density to the ring, thereby destabilizing it. They can do this through resonance or hyperconjugation. Deactivators, on the other hand, remove electron density from the ring via resonance as well, or inductive electron withdrawal, which I discussed in my acidity video, and it's a consequence of electronegativity. If you're interested, you can read up 
uh, more of these factors in a textbook or Google it. But really, I don't see any need because this is all you need. The chart of most substituents with their effects and relative strengths. The strongest activators at the top and the strongest deactivators at the bottom. Everything in the middle, completing the spectrum. You don't even need to memorize this. I mean, you can if you want, if you're into that sort of thing, but there are some shortcuts. Here's how I look at it. Nitro, nitrile, and sulfo groups are the strongest deactivators, and everything else that has a carbon attached to the ring before an oxygen is meta-directing. The halogens are in the middle, weakly deactivating but ortho directing and then anything with an oxygen attached to a ring and then a carbon, all the way up to the amine group, are activating and ortho directing Notice the difference. Ring to carbon to oxygen is meta. Ring to oxygen to carbon is ortho para. I just can't see a circumstance where you need to know individual rankings of these functional groups for an MCAT question, so just stick to the big picture stuff and use that trend I just described. So let's apply this chart and everything talked about in this video to a few benzene rings. First up is chlorination of toluene. Per our chart, the methyl group of toluene is a weak activator, meaning it will direct in the ortho para direction. Given that there are two ortho spots for the chlorine to add, both of which will result in the same product, and the methyl group isn't too sterically hindering, the ortho product will be favored over the para. The ortho will be the major product, the para will be the minor. Next we have nitration of benzaldehyde. The aldehyde group, ring then carbon then oxygen, equals meta-directing. There are two spots for the nitro group to go, but regardless of where it goes, it will be the same compound, 3-nitrobenzaldehyde, so that will be the only product. How about a ring with two substituents? What will the major product of bromination of 2-hydroxybenzaldehyde be? The hydroxyl group is ortho directing, but the aldehyde is meta. We have two options where the bromine can add that would satisfy both of these directing conditions, and you can see them here. Which one of these makes the most sense? Well, reason it out. Adding at the 3 position would be ortho to the hydroxyl group and meta to the aldehyde, but this position is rather sterically hindered, so that's probably not the major product. Adding at the 5 position would be para to the hydroxyl and meta to the aldehyde, fitting both substituents directing, and there's much less stuff in the way over there, so that's probably going to be the major product. And that's how you do these types of questions, and that's really all there is to it, to electrophilic aromatic substitution. Here are some questions. Pause the video while you work on them, as the answer slide will appear in about five seconds, so pause it now. And here are the answers. Pause the video if you'd like more time to review, and as always, if you have any questions or comments, just post them in the comments section of this video and I'll get back to you. So that's electrophilic aromatic substitution. It's probably one of the simpler topics in orgo. Um, nomenclature might be a little bit easier, but EAS is definitely one of the easier topics, but don't neglect studying for it because of that. You never know how nerves and fatigue are going to play out on test day. So if this video was all the review you needed, then I guess I did my job.